truth. I'm punch. I'm punch. I'm punch. I'm forbidden. Truth. I'm hot. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. On this week's episode, I'll be speaking with convicted murderer Dustin Shu. On October 19th, 2016, 26-year-old Scott Phillips was kidnapped, tortured, and beaten by six individuals. Scott later died from his injuries in a hospital. The six individuals that were charged and convicted in this case are Walter Smith, Melissa Leuton, Dennis Perkane, Eric Perkane, Daniel Shaw, and Dustin Shu. Eric and Dennis pled guilty to kidnapping and were sentenced to five years in prison. Melissa pled guilty to forcible confinement, receiving a four-year prison sentence. Walter Smith pled guilty to being an accessory to murder and was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Daniel Shaw pled guilty to forcible confinement and received a five-year prison sentence. Dustin Shue pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 13 years. Here's my interview with convicted murderer Dustin Shue. Let's start off with talking about your childhood. Where were you born? I was born in Lincoln Park, Michigan. That's where I was born. Can you recall your first positive memory as a child? First positive memory as a child. I have to say, like, uh, like uh, Christmas time. We used to have, like, like when I was a young kid, we used to have good, uh, good family gatherings and just being around family and having everybody together and opening up presents and partying together. And when I'm in the, when I was a kid, we used to have like a bunch of big group of kids around. I used to be like a bigger family, you know, back in the day and stuff. So that was probably like my first, first positive family uh, interaction I can remember anyway. Can you recall your first negative memory as a child? Getting hit, getting, get, getting beat as a kid. Those are like the, the, the first things that pop into my mind, the negative experience. Was that like at home or a school setting or? That was at home. Besides, you know, being hit, did you suffer any childhood abuse or trauma, whether that be home, school, you know, in the community? Basically, uh, as a kid, there was there was um, abuse in, in, in the household, as in uh, like um, my, like uh, domestic violence was 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 present in the household and. Um, long as you know kids could beat all the time and, and, and stuff but sometimes there was there was instances where it got took at a at a hand or there was times of being extra where there wasn't really need to really get get beat and there was there was that so yeah there was there was a little bit of there was the, there was definitely definitely some domestic violence going on in the household as a kid growing up i'm assuming a male figure would be abusing your mother it would also be taken out on you as well yeah, exactly. So, so basically, my brother and sister's dad was my stepdad, but that's the only father that I ever knew because I never actually met my real father. You know what I'm saying? So, him and my mother were constantly in domestic disputes all the time. But there was, and it would be the, either they drunk and 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 and, and on drugs or, and they just get into it. And we just happen to be there all the time. But see, my brother and sister's a little bit younger than me, so they don't really get the whole experience like I did. I was the old, I'm the oldest out of the bunch, so I remember these things. How often would you say that that happened? Was it like maybe a weekly or you know bi-weekly incident? Or uh, honestly, being that I was so young, it's hard to pinpoint and say how often it did happen. But it happened enough. You know, happened enough, and uh, happened to my my mom wasn't no slouch neither. She 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 played her part in it too. You know, she'd be beating up on him too sometimes too, right? So they were like going back and forth. She's like one of them little crazy little devils, you know. She ain't having it. She ain't gonna just sit there and get beat. She's fighting back. So there was a couple of times that she she got the better of him too. So um, as of often, man, I could probably think of like. Off the top of my brain, one, two, three, maybe like four or five good, good, bad, bad fights that happened between them. That was bad, but as in like domestic violence being, it was just a consistent thing. But it kind of got, there was a point in life where it was good 
as being a younger kid, and then it dropped off to where the drugs and alcohol came involved and in, in, into play. And then my stepdad, my dad, his his um his mother, which was I consider as my grandmother, she died, and then my mom, my mom's mom, my other grandmother died, and they both died in the same around the same time in the same time frame. So when that happened, that's when everything basically just hit the fan. And it just got too bad to the point where my mom had to pick up and leave, and I left with her. What was your behavior like going back as early as you can remember? I used to think I was a happy kid, um, but my thing, I remember when when, when we was kids, was, we used to like wrestling all the time. So And then growing up in an abusive household with, the, with all the domestic violence going on, we used to be fighting all the time, but that was kind of like a a thing. Like, we'd go to school and we'd be fighting, you know, we'd be doing other wrestling moves at school on people and stuff. And um, So, looking back on it now, because um, when you're in that situation, you don't really feel like certain things ain't normal because what is normal to everybody's normal is different. But, so at that time, you know, when when you grew up in that environment, you feel like that's what you're doing, what you're going through is normal. But now, yeah, we were kind of a little bit more of a of, of violent kids. Now you think about it compared to, like, cookie-cutter, picket-white fence type of families uh, in the suburbs that you see now. Now looking back on it, right? When you said, you know, you were more like a little bit more so like a violent kid, was that like, were you committing, you know, like petty crimes at a young age or like burglaries or robberies? Um, not, not, not too many, like, violent crimes, but when I was a young kid, we was, you know, we was going around, like, um, I said, what the first thing I actually got caught for doing that was illegal was, uh, stealing from a store, not from a Zeller's, actually. We were stealing, uh, we were stealing, we were stealing, um, bike packs for the BMXs and shoes and, and I remember there were the newest and ones out. And uh, we didn't, we didn't both remember now um, there's drugs being used in the family. So we didn't really have a bunch of money. And uh, so I wanted to get these shoes bad. So we couldn't really afford to get them. So I went out to the store and I put my old shoe in the shoe box and took the new shoes out and wore them out. We were stealing. We got caught stealing. That was like my first kind of um, interactions with, with crime. That was my first time getting caught up doing anything criminal was stealing. Um, and we we I did that a lot of the kids stealing shit, stealing uh, breaking into cars and stealing shit from school and you know breaking doing B and E's in people's houses stuff like that. Pretty much basic petty nonviolent crimes growing up. Petty stuff, yeah, petty not like nothing too, not nothing really super violent or nothing like that. Can you remember what your behavior was like in school, more so through middle school and high school years? I remember. In middle school, I had a lot of, I think in middle school more actually than high school, I had more of a issue with authority with teachers. Um, you know, if I didn't like a teacher or, or uh, something what a teacher was doing, I wasn't having, I remember I got into an issue when I was in middle school with a, with a French teacher. And uh, I forget exactly what sparked it off. Oh, I couldn't say they wanted me to say a, a French phrase to ask the teacher to go to the bathroom, and she wanted I had to go to the bathroom. She wanted me to go to the bathroom until I said this French phrase that I couldn't say. I got upset after a while through a chair at her. I remember I got in trouble for that. I got suspended for that. And uh, I say that was like more of a de- defiant, violent behavior kind of. And now in, in high school, I kind of more grew out of it, but I'm getting in, I'm getting in fights in school all the time. And mind you, we're, I'm growing up in the hood too at the same time, so it's like we, it's a poorer neighborhood. So, you know, I'm one of the only. There's not a lot of white guys in the school either, so you kind of got to hold your own over here or whatever the case is too, right? So, um, I'll be getting a couple of little fights at school or whatever. But basketball is really what got me through school. I think if 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 I never if I never had a love for basketball the way I did, and that's what. I built in middle school that got me all the way through high school. I would have dropped out of high school. I would have never finished high school because I didn't have no interest in doing being in high school. Did you finish high school? I did finish high school. I graduated. And but if I didn't get if I if it wasn't for my basketball coach pushing me through it, I would have never I would have never graduated because I was on my own at sixteen. I was on my own. 
I got kicked out of my 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 stepdad kicked me out the house, 16 years old now, and I went to a group home for a little bit. Now when I went into the group home, um, I didn't like it there, so they had like this little uh, apartments that they rented for older kids, and then they funded it. And it was now now that I'm older and I look at it, it's basically like a halfway house for kids. They come in, they buy the groceries, everybody has their little chores they have to do when there's rules. You can't bring girls, you can't drink, you can't smoke, whatever, and in the house and other stuff. So I went into one of those houses and um I was bringing girls back into the to the room and drinking and these little kids there was was telling on me. So I, that didn't last long, and they were telling me, listen, you're going to get kicked out of here, and you ain't going to be able to go nowhere because you can't get put on social assistance until you're 18, and you ain't old enough. So, and I had no no other uh, uh, legal guardian that could sign for me that would get the check for me and give it to me. Uh, so the, the, the group was called The Inn, and um, they actually ended up doing it for me to be my trustee. And, and when they were my trustee now, uh, I would go pick up my my money from them. They would get my check, cash it. I would get it from them, and then go pay my rent. I got a, uh, a little university housing room. That was my first place on my own ever. Yeah, that's basically uh, how I started out over there. And I, and 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 because I had all that. Now imagine you're in high school, and you ain't had you. Know, you have nobody, you have no parents to make you go to school. You live on your own, in your own room, in a university house with a bunch of kids that's partying all the time. You could do whatever you want. So my first option was not, I'm going to go to school. My first option is I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kick it with my friends, have fun, and party. And my basketball coach ended up being the main positive role male figure in my life and he pulled me up and there's actually three of them but the main one that was there was was a uh, pat osborne was a guidance counselor and then actually another one now um and then um was was mark and it was both that was the assistant coach and they was both there with me and uh they they basically was on my ass to to to, to get school done and then and, and do right and that's the only reason why i ended up finishing school in the first place being that you were on your own since you were 16, were you or are you getting affiliated at any point in time, whether it was then or now? Um, no, I'm not. I haven't been, and uh, that's just never really been my thing. I never, uh, I never got into none of the gang stuff. Do you have a criminal record in the United States or in Canada after you turned 18 up until the crime put you in prison? Um, I don't have a criminal record in America. Um, as I, when I first caught my first criminal charges over in Canada, um, I didn't have my full citizenship over here, so I couldn't go back to the states and stay there because they wouldn't let me back across the border here. So that's what in turn got got me stuck over in Canada uh, as long as I've been over here for. When and how did you get to Canada from the U.S. for not having your citizenship? Basically, what happened was my mom, she uh, met my stepdad over in Detroit at a nightclub. And uh, they just hit it off and they ended up moving to Windsor and having my brother and my sister. And then ever since then, it was been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we used to go because cause my grandmother used to live over there and my aunt, uh, my, my, my uncle, and whatever. So we used to go back and forth every weekend to go visit and stuff. And uh, my mom stayed over there for a while, too. So sometimes I would, would, you know, I, I would go over there. And it's, it's kind of just been back and forth ever since. I was 17, and then after I was 17, that was my last summer I was over there, and then uh, I never went back over there ever since. Let's talk about the crime that you're currently in prison for. You're convicted of second-degree murder alongside five others in the kidnapping and murder of 26-year-old Scott Phillips. 
Can you walk me through everything that led up to the kidnapping, the murder, and everything that transpired after the fact, as much as you can recall? Basically, what led up to it was uh, a debt, is what led up to it. Um, so it was in the streets, and there was a situation where um, this man and his partner had owed me X amount of dollars, and, uh, you know, they came across something that they wasn't supposed to come across, and they they ended up getting me for for a little bit of paper. And uh, so there was supposed to be a there was supposed to be a plan to make it back, and this plan just never came into action. You get what I'm saying? So um, how the kidnapping came into play was. Uh, When this guy went out, he 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 basically went missing, and he kind of ran off. So I had uh, I had somebody want go look for him for me, and uh, it was kind of just a spur of the moment thing, just how it happened. And they hit me and said, "Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I'm with him, I got him," type of type of thing. So basically, uh, we just pulled up there and grabbed him from where he was at, you know, was at a coffee shop. We just pulled up and, and, and scooped him from the coffee shop and uh, brought him over to to the spot where where, where the crime was, was committed at. And um, I'm not going to mention nobody else's names because the interview is with me and you, and I don't want, I'm not going to say anything that's going to have any kind of criminal Im- implications on anybody else, and everything that I'm speaking is already facts that's been pled to um, that I'm that, that that I'm doing time for. So these are all facts that are in paperwork that are in, in, in black and white. But um, I brought him to an apartment building, and now uh, when I got him up into the apartment building, it was basically supposed to be um, his people were supposed to come drop me off some paper for him, and then I was gonna let him go, but it just didn't end up working like that. So. Um, as the night went longer, you know what I mean? I tied him up and tried to make some sense of what he was doing. And the longer the night went, the more frustrated I got. And the more, uh, you know, the more I got to drinking and it just turned out to be where I'm at right now. So I'm reading a news article on blackburnnews.com. And it says that the victim in this case, Phillips, had been targeted the month before. I believe he was stabbed, but they weren't sure if, if it had anything to do with his case. Do you know if it did or if it just yeah. happened to be an isolated incident? They um now this is another thing here. So this is like this is what happened basically is they charged me with that. But they stayed the charges on me. So I guess yeah, there was a situation where um he got stabbed. He he ended up getting stabbed up I think it was sixteen mm-hmm. times in a project downtown and um uh, i got charged for these after the fact and uh they were they were trying to build this as their motive for the murder case to try me on but they didn't have enough evidence to say to really convict me on those charges um so they were just laying phony charges that they couldn't really stick on to um so i can't really get too deep into that as it because it was still still a, still an open case against me, but uh, those things did happen to him. Um, but have anything to do with me? They have nothing to do with me. They just they just happened to be like there was a few things that happened to him and his boy that just led up to the fact of what happened to him. And um, you know when you're playing in the streets and you're doing shady shit, there's a there's there's there's, there's other people. Um, that might have issues with you besides just one person. You get what I'm saying? So I don't, I'm not really, um, I don't really know what other shit he was into that, 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 that brought that onto him from before. Uh, but yeah, those, there were incidences where he was involved in, um, prior up to just prior before the murder occurred on. The night that Mr. Phillips, you know, was tied up, what was going through your mind during the commission of the crime? I know that you said that alcohol was involved a little bit. Was it just rage or, you know, a whole lot of emotions just blown into you know, one? 
was uh, it was like rage and frustration and uh, disappointment, um, fatigue, all that. Man, this is an ongoing thing, and um, I'm not really a violent person like that, so it's kind of out of my character to be uh, to to do what I did. Um, so that those were the emotions that were running through me and yeah there was a little bit of alcohol involved but uh you know i could have dealt with it better than the way i did deal with it that wouldn't know uh, that wouldn't affect the two people's lives the way it did because now uh, this this man had had kids and a family and, and so do i so now it affects a lot of people moving down the line right so um but that's what I was trying to avoid. I was trying to avoid that the whole time. Instead, that's what my whole thing was. I was trying to avoid that the whole time. Uh, you know, so those those were the the, the key emotions, I guess, that 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 uh, were uh, running through my mind at that at that night. With just speaking about yourself, after the crime occurred, and of course this was an assault at that point in time. What happened after the fact when you had left that night? After I left, I basically just went went over to a spot and called it a night. And um, I think as as a as a building up off an adrenaline and a hype and 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 plus the alcohol and everything and and not really being in my full state of mind didn't really um, kick into me how severe the damages was that I that that I did so was 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 like I just kind of felt like you know he'd be at the hospital and he'll be all right type of thing like he might have been he might have been fucked up but he'll be alive type of thing you know so um yeah I just basically uh went to a spot and went to bed and then uh woke up and then all the all the fireworks was going on and it was police everywhere and crazy 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 uh noise was going on so um i just picked up and i just picked up and boogied out of there were you afraid that you were going to get arrested or did you feel like you had some type of confidence that you'd be able to get away with it um i was obviously afraid i was going to get arrested um i didn't i didn't really think i was going to get arrested but i mean i, I was uh I was af- I was afraid. I just wanted to know what was gonna happen. Basically, I didn't know I didn't know the severity of the situation. Um, so I was just basically trying to. I just basically went to a safe place just to 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 wait out to see what exactly was going on. It's see how serious the situation actually was, right? So how long after the crime occurred, and after that he had passed away in the hospital, were you arrested? Basically, okay what day it was I forget what day it was but it was only it was less than a month after um the crime occurred that i got arrested and uh i got arrested in london so i got arrested at a hotel in london uh, in, in london ontario at a hotel there that's what i got arrested and I, I was the first one arrested when you got arrested was that peaceful or was there like a standoff or anything of the sort when I got arrested, it was peaceful. Um, basically, they surrounded uh, the hotel, and uh, I woke up. I woke up to the police knocking on the door and calling the, the the hotel phone. And I answered the phone, and they told me, "Okay, yeah, we got the whole place surrounded. You know, we're gonna need you to come out." And um, so, uh, yeah, I just got ready to come out. I wrote some numbers down. I had, uh, I had, uh, I have. Five thousand in cash on me. Um, that was it. I got arrested. I split it up with the person I was with, so we both had canteen. So we was good for canteen. We had some money on our books when we were going in. We wrote some phone important phone numbers down on a piece of paper, put that in our pocket, and we came out. Mm-hmm. And we came out peaceful. And uh, they came in. They did the forensics on us uh, in London. And then the Windsor police came and they, they, they came and grabbed us up that night and brought us right back to Windsor Station where they tried to, um, you know, they tried to do the little interview. But 
they didn't get me in there, but they got everybody else in there. Were you offered any type of plea deals while you were on trial? Uh, I didn't make it to the trial. The only deal I was offered was the one that I took. Um, or actually, no, no, I'm lying. They 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 did offer me a, a they offered me a second degree when it was um, right before trial. They offered me a second degree, um, fifteen years. Yeah, it was fifteen years. Uh, second degree, fifteen years life. So life fifteen, second degree, and uh, but we hadn't even did a pre-trial court, none of that. So uh, we were we were feeling pretty pretty confident in in what was going to be uh, evidence allowed in and, and and not. So we wanted to do some yeah, we wanted to do some uh, more thorough investigation ourselves into what we was looking at and to get uh, more information than we had because we didn't really have much because our prelim got the uh, our prelim prelim got messed up and we had our original prelim date and uh the crown filed uh, a trial motion and we fought the motion and we won it but we ended up losing our dates in turn so we had to reschedule and uh now this whole process is taking years of time uh, so they just squeezed our prelim dates into our pretrial date, and now that's the court where you go for to where they're putting all the evidence in, and now the crown and the pros the crown and the prosecution are fighting you on what should be allowed in that trial or not. So we want to see how that would go first before we even thought about making a deal. Mm-hmm. And then after they offered me that deal, I turned it down, and then uh, my co-accused all took deals against me. And when they did that, that in turn forced me to take my plea deal. Which was second degree murder, life with the possibility of parole after 13 years? Right. So after you did take that plea deal and you were convicted of second degree murder, receiving life with the possibility of parole after 13 years, what was your reaction? Oh, uh, man, it happened so fast. It was, a, it was like a punch in the gut, you know? Yeah, it was a punch in the gut. Um, but at the same time, I was glad that it was over with and I could just move forward and stand for everybody. So I wanted to take accountability for what I did um, and relieve the pressure on the family, the victim's family, and relieve the pressure on my own family and just try to put a, try to put everything past me and and and, and go ahead and and work on my release and, and, and just work on letting everybody be at peace and leaving it go, you know? And um, I thought that was the best situation I could do. You know, the best thing that I, that, that I could do. Well, instead of instead of dragging everybody through a trial, you know, I know what I did, so I wanted to take accountability for what I did and, and just get it on and just get it over with. You know, you make decisions in life. I made my decisions and now I'm living with it. And now... Uh, I'm doing what I can to to make it right, as right as it could be, and uh, you know, move move forward, better, bigger, and better. So, what does an average day in prison consist of for you these days? Um, these days, I'm just trying to get yeah, just eat healthy. My, you know, I got a nice little regiment with the diet and uh, uh, training schedule where I'm working out, weight training, and, and uh, do I play basketball, cardio training, and um, I hit the library and get get a nice dose of books and try to get my brain workouts in as well. Try to try to get um soak up as much knowledge and wisdom as I can while I'm in here, and uh, you know just do everything I can that's in my hands um, to better myself as a man and and uh, put my time and use in here, man. I don't just sit around and watch TV and uh, and route away. I try to do um positive things in him. Does the institution you're in now offer any type of rehabilitation classes or opportunities to further your education? They do have programs. Uh, that's part of my correctional plan that I'm waiting to do. I participate in every program that I can. Um, whatever programs that are available to me, I, I, uh, I take them. That's part of your rehabilitation. Um, 
they do offer post secondary, um, kind of at a cost. Like they have a uh, bursary um, programs, bursary and grant programs that you can sign up for and basically do correspondence. Um, but because of my status over here, um, well, my, my my immigration status is. Uh, I lost all my ID, so I had to land the immigrant papers, uh, which which enabled me to get a SIN number, um, which would enable me to apply for all these programs. But I um, I lost all those documents, and uh, so I've been trying to do what I can to get them back, but uh, not much help out here. So uh, you know, all I do is try to. Um, try to learn what I can on my own from the library and from the programs that are offered to me. And, uh, yeah, that's about it, man. That's well, because of COVID now COVID been hard times. So it's not, there ain't been a lot of programs going on. There ain't been a lot of visits going on. There ain't been a lot of nothing going on. So it's been a lot of isolation going on. So, um, it's getting a little bit better now, but even right now we still locked down. The jail is still locked down over here. So if, and when you are paroled Monday, how do you envision your life then? I envision my life as 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 basically a free, strong, smart man that has a lot to offer to society. Um, that's learned a lot and has been fully rehabilitated and has put the whole system to to the best of its abilities. You know, I'm going to take every every tool that the system offers me and I'm going to use it the way that I'm supposed to use it and in turn to rehabilitate myself and come out and be a better person and to be a productive member of society um, the way that I want to be and be, 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 be the father that I know I can be and will be and uh, the man that I know I can be and will be, you know, and I'm, I'm going to go out there and build build something for myself, build something for myself and build something for my kids. You know what I mean? And that's it, man. Just, just get back to regular life, you know, pay my debt to society and, uh, and move on and just move on from it, man. And, uh, learn, learn from it. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered yet? I think we basically covered it all. I just feel like um, sometimes, so, sometimes us guys in here get a bad rep, and uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of good dudes that's in here. So um, basically, don't forget about about your loved ones that are that are locked down, that are incarcerated, because there's mm -hmm. there's good guys in here, and they forget about us, you know. But we're coming home, and you know, we're doing our best in here. So. Um, Free all the dogs that's in here that's that's actually trying to do good with their life, and that's actually uh, putting in work to, to 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 make that happen. And um, yeah, I just want to just 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 give a shout out to all the people in here that's 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 doing their bids and that's trying to come home. And um, to to all my family and all my loved ones out there, just to give a big shout out to them and thank you for holding me down. And it's not easy, not easy to be in a situation like this. And it's it. it it ain't never easy, you know, and and also, you know, to the victims' family, is there's 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 always um remorse. There's always remorse and and um and sorrow and 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 and, and uh, the best positive wishes for me, uh, no matter what the situation is. So, you know, I'm just trying to get my life together and get right and. Uh, I wish that for everybody. So just on a positive vibe and I want everybody else to be on that vibe too. So basically that's it. And, um, I got, if anybody really has, um, questions for me and they want to contact me over here, um, my, I'm sure my proper spelling will be on there, but my, my first name is Dustin and my last name is Shu and it's spelled S C H U H and the address to the institution that I'm at is 2000 2000 Beaver Creek Drive and the P it's PO box 5000 it's in Gravenhurst Ontario 
and the postal code is P1P1Y6. So if anybody that's, that's listening to this ever has a, a, a question or felt like reaching out to me or whatever the case is, that's my contact information, and and I appreciate you reaching out to me to do the interview. Um, and and it's, I'm, I'm glad you have a platform like this to, to kind of show, get, give guys a chance to tell their side of things, and and um, it's, a, it's it's a good look, you know. That's what that's what guys that that are in here need, because oftentimes we're forgotten about in here. So. With your platform and 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 the time that you take out to to interview guys gives us a voice that sometimes we don't have and that more people should look into because uh, there's a lot of good guys that have been rehabilitated in here that ain't getting out and that deserve to be out. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the time and uh, I I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me, man. That was my interview with convicted murderer Dustin Shu. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden truth. Truth.